We all have a place that we call home. It might be an apartment or a two-story house. We might have bought it or still live in paying rent. But there is one fact that doesn't change, and that is the people that live around us. In many cases, we might not even know the names of our neighbors, or we might just exchange an occasional hello now and then. But we can't know those people well enough. In today's video, we are counting down five cases of people that really should have known their neighbors better. Number 1 According to police, on September 1st, John Miller, age 67, and his son Michael Miller, age 31, got into a confrontation with their neighbor over a box spring mattress in a shared alleyway. The argument escalated and both father and son discharged a handgun and a shotgun respectively, killing 35-year-old Aaron Howard. The Millers had been arrested on murder charges. They both immediately bonded out on initial bonds, set up on $25,000 each. The Millers were taken into custody again on Friday afternoon after a court reviewed their bonds and raised them to $2,500,000 each. Online jail records Friday said the Millers faced charges of first-degree murder. The Taylor County Criminal Court clerk said they had not been formally charged. Howard's common lowlife, Cara Box, filmed the incident on her phone and released the footage to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram newspaper. When the video begins, John and Michael Miller are standing by what looks to be a box spring mattress. The father holds a handgun in his right hand, while his son stands behind him with a shotgun over his shoulder. Oh yeah, you're going to jail, Howard tells him, before walking toward the elder Miller. I'm right here, he says. Back off, John Miller says. If you come closer to me, I'm going to kill you. You pulled a gun in front of my kids, over a mattress, Howard says. He also repeatedly threatens to kill the Millers, according to the video. The confrontation escalates as both sides let loose profanities and threats. Police have said at some point someone went inside Howard's home and brought out a baseball bat. If you come within three foot of me, I'm going to kill you, John Miller tells Howard. You're not going to shoot my husband, Box says. Come on, shoot me, Howard says, before two gunshots ring out. After a brief moment, more gunshots can be heard. Box cries and runs towards Howard, who's lying on the ground. Howard died of at least two gunshot wounds, according to police. Both John and Michael Miller admitted to shooting Howard. When the first shots were fired, Aaron had a bat in his hand and was approximately seven feet from John Miller, who was closest to him. When Michael Miller discharged his gun and John Miller fired the final two rounds from his pistol, Aaron Howard was unarmed. Based on Box's footage and interviews with the suspects, the statement said a detective determined the Millers were tired of their neighbor, Aaron Howard, acting out and yelling and threatening them verbally prompting them to bring out their firearms. As soon as Howard raised the bat while approximately seven or more feet away from John, John shot him. Number 2 Imagine sleeping in your comfortable bed in your bedroom one day and suddenly wake up and realize you're in a war zone. On Saturday, October 20th, 2018, the sleepy northeast bend neighborhood of Macaw was the scene of a horrific and tragic incident that resulted in the deaths of 33-year-old Bend resident Kyle Adams and 31-year-old Bend resident Tyler Herrick. Adams was asleep in his bedroom when he was awakened by his neighbor, Herrick, who was standing in the bedroom. Herrick had no permission to be in the house, much less Adams' bedroom. Herrick spouted off an intelligible gibberish, and Adams demanded that he leave. Herrick left the bedroom and the house. 
Adams texts his roommate, 31-year-old band resident, Brennan Pebbles. Adams told Pebbles that Harry had entered the house without permission. Pebbles immediately came home from work. Adams and Pebbles were in their living room, discussing what Harry had done. While they were talking, and unbeknownst to them, Harry approached the front yard of their home with an AR-15 rifle. Harry stood in front of the living room window, aimed his fire at Adams and Pebbles, and fired multiple shots that shattered the front window. At least one of the rounds struck Adams, who eventually died from his injury. Pebbles fled from the living room and ran upstairs. Once upstairs, he grabbed his 9mm handgun and hid in the bathroom of the master bedroom. Herrick fired multiple shots at the front door and entered the home and methodically hunted Pebbles down in a room-to-room -room search. When Herrick entered the master bedroom, Pebbles shot and killed him. Herrick had no justification to be in Adams and Pebbles' home and no justification to open fire on them. Adams and Pebbles had done nothing to end his Herrick or to cause his ire. The investigation into what caused Herrick to do what he did is continuing, but it's clear now that Pebbles' decision to shoot Herrick was legally authorized and saved his life. Brennan Pebbles struggles with the pain of seeing his friend murdered next to him, being hunted down himself and then shooting and killing the assailant to save his life. No charges are expected to be filed, as Pebbles was fully cooperative with investigators in all evidence points to self-defense. Oregon court records show none of the three men have had criminal records. So why does someone with no criminal record do this? We are living in a crazy world, guys. That's for sure. Number 3. Another sad story of racism by a police officer. Amber Renee Geiger, a Dallas police officer, was arrested on Sunday, September 9, 2018, on a manslaughter warrant in the shooting of her black neighbor at his home, which was an apartment above hers. Geiger told investigators that she had just ended a 15-hour shift when she returned in uniform to the South Side Flats apartment complex. She parked on the fourth floor instead of the third, where she lived possibly suggesting that she was confused or disoriented when she put her key in the apartment door, which was unlocked and slightly ajar. It opened. Inside, the lights were off, and she saw a figure in the darkness that cast a large silhouette across the room. The officer told the police that she concluded that her apartment was being burglarized and gave verbal commands to the figure, which ignored them. She then drew her weapon and fired twice. She called 911 and when asked where she was, returned to the front door to see she was in the wrong unit. The Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office said Jean died of a gunshot wound to the chest. His death was ruled a homicide. The officer was arrested on Sunday night and booked into jail in neighborhood Kaufman County before being released on bond. Still, there are clues missing. Why would someone leave his apartment door ajar? And how did the officer confused that this was her apartment, since Jean had the only key and the biggest red mat outside of his door, so people wouldn't confuse his own apartment as theirs? Two independent witnesses have told that they heard knocking on the door in the hallway before the shooting. One witness reported hearing a woman's voice saying, Let me in. Then they heard gunshots after which one witness said she heard a man's voice say, Oh my God, why did you do that? Geiger's blood was drawn at the scene to be tested for alcohol and drugs, Hall said, but authorities have not released results. Jean grew up in the Caribbean island nation of San Lucia before attending college in Arkansas. He graduated in 2016 from Hardling University where he often led campus religious services as a student. He had worked for an accounting firm, PwC, since graduating. From a short investigation, turned out that Jean wasn't the first person shot by Geiger. 
She saw a man named Valdo Perez on May 12, 2017, while on duty. Number four, Wendell Popejoy killed his neighbor Sheila Bonge on December 26, 2017, near both of their homes on 104th Avenue in Ottawa County's Crockery Township. He shot her while she was snow blowing. Two days after she disappeared, her family found her body under snowfall down a hill behind Pope Joy's house. He shot her in the back of the head, then pushed her body down the hill on a sled. He burned her clothes in a burn barrel. He initially denied any role in her killing, but eventually confessed. His attorney, Jeff Cordes, contended Pope Joy was at his wits and dealing with Bonge. Who was shooting snow into his driveway before he shot her? Ottawa County Prosecutor Ronald Franch described the killing as an execution. Bob Joy, age 64, was convicted on Monday, October 15th, of first-degree murder and will be sentenced on November 5th to a mandatory life prison term without the possibility of parole. The victim's family was grateful for the jury's verdict. But said Bonch was unfairly portrayed at trial as a problem neighbor. They said that there were problems between three families. The only told one side of the story, her brother Dennis Luke said after the verdict, it was three participants that were aggravating each other. He was aware of troubles, but he didn't think Bob Joy would go to that extent. Number five. John and Melinda Smith, age 66 and 59, were fatally stabbed by their 17-year-old neighbor, Jorge Garment, around 5:30 a.m. on April 26 at their home in South Bexar County. The morning of April 26, 2018, a neighbor had heard the Smiths arguing with a young man outside their residence, followed by a single gunshot. She notified authorities, and a Bexar County Sheriff's Office deputy was dispatched to the home to investigate. Bexar County Deputy Castellano wrote in the offense report he first found John Smith's car parked with its trunk open and several bags inside. Then he found the bodies. I did approach the front porch and observed John Smith lying on the front porch, covered in blood on his chest. He says. John Smith told Castellano he was stabbed by a neighbor who lives across the street to the right of his residence, and that his wife was inside. Castellano and another deputy found Melinda Smith unresponsive and covered in blood in the home. I did ask John Smith again what happened. Castellano writes, John stated he was going to work, and the neighbor across the street came to his vehicle and told him to get out of the car. John stated he did exit his vehicle and Garment stabbed him. John also stated his daughter had run away recently. I did ask John why Garment had stabbed him. John told me he didn't know why he was stabbed. John Smith gave a brief description of Garment to Castellano. Then paramedics took him to Brock Army Medical Center for treatment. He later died from his wounds. Melinda was pronounced dead at the scene. Jorge Carmen has been kicked out of his home the night before the attack, and his packed bags were discovered in the victim's car. Carmen was going to use the Smith's vehicle, whether with the Smith's consent or without it, and travel to another location. Then the investigation took a strange turn. Authorities began their hunt for Carmen, with several deputies interviewing witnesses and collecting evidence. And a helicopter unit hovering above the scene. At about 9 a.m., deputies finally spotted him only a block from the scene, giving an interview to MySA.com. Before deputies could take him away for questioning, Carmud gave MySA a false name, George Bravo, and described the Smiths as a quiet, reserved couple. He said he knew their adopted daughter, who had recently run away to Houston to be with her birth family. He also mentioned he had some disagreements with the couple. According to the offense report, Carmen told authorities John Smith was going to give him a ride downtown, and that the bags in the trunk of the car were his. Investigators then spoke with Carmen's mother, 
who told them she had kicked him out of the house hours before the killing. She gave them consent to search her home. Inside, investigators found evidence tying Carmen to the slayings. Carmen was then taken in for questioning and allegedly confessed to the crime.